Hello everyone uh, to this lecture on solver mathematics and post processing. This is one of the last lectures we are having so uh, what we already expect from you is that you have uh, quite familiar with CFD now and uh, also are especially familiar with the mathematics behind how the differential equations which govern the fluid flow and heat transfer are solved and uh, what are the constraints, what are the limitations um, with which uh, we have to deal with the simulation results. Uh, what we'll also be learning in this uh, in this presentation is to uh, extract valuable information out of your simulation to make the best out of your simulation process and uh, appropriately to ensure that your solution has a good convergence and you can achieve accuracy. So we're going to see the, uh, the effects of accuracy versus stability of a CFD solution in the course of this coming few slides. To start with, we'll uh, concentrate on solver mathematics and then we'll move on to post-processing in ANSYS Fluent. So have an idea, to just to give an idea about the different topics that will be covered within the solver mathematics, uh, it includes the choice of the solver in ANSYS Fluent. It also includes um, how the discretization will be done uh, spatially uh, for um, the advection term and for the diffusion term. We'll have a look at that and uh, we see the different kinds of methods for pressure and density interpolation onto the phases from the cell-centered values. We see for pressure-based solvers what is this concept of pressure velocity coupling, how the initialization and the iterating process works in ANSYS Fluent and uh, we'll see how we can uh, maximize uh, convergence at the quickest possible uh, rate and achieve good accuracy. So the, these are the three factors we have to take into account. Let's we'll see some uh, best practices to troubleshoot or uh, the difficulties we may have in achieving convergence and good accurate results. So this is the overall solution procedure for uh, a given CFD simulation. So once the problem has been set up, this is where the tasks of uh, the solver has to really uh, begin with to set up the solver parameters. So this is what we do. This is what we are trying to learn in this course in this uh, coming few slides. Uh, once that is done, we initialize the flow and uh, enabling some monitors of interest, we start calculating the solution. During the course of the solution process, we check whether we have achieved convergence. If that is the case, we go on to check for accuracy. But if we have not achieved convergence, which is often the case with real life projects, we have to go back and modify some parameters, check our problem definition, if we have made some mistakes, if we have included the appropriate physics or not, or if the solver parameters are right. And until we can achieve convergence, once convergence is reached, we check whether we have achieved good enough amount of accuracy. If that is the case, we stop the process. We take those results. Otherwise, we modify the parameters and again, try to check for convergence and for accuracy later. So that gives you a brief uh, description about how the solver works. But let's ask ourselves, what are we trying to solve? So maybe you remember this slide from earlier. What this is the, these are the equations which we are trying to solve in CFD. So continuity and momentum together making what is called the flow equations. So the, if I can solve the continuity and the momentum equation, I can define the flow completely. And in addition to this, I can also consider solving the energy equation. So just this general transport equation, just replacing the value of phi by different parameters, I get the different kinds of equations. So this is the mass conservation, this is Newton's second law, and the first law of thermodynamics is what we have here in the energy equation. In addition to this, we also have different kinds of model dependent transport equations. Let's say I'm modeling the turbulence according to a two equation model. In that case, those two equations also have to be solved. If I'm also including uh, multiple species simulation, in that case, the mass fraction of the multiple species also needs to be included. And such additional transport equations can also be solved. Now that we know what the equations are, let's see how we can solve them. So ANSYS Fluent offers three uh, popular methods by which these equations can be solved. Uh, two of them are fall under the category called the pressure-based equations. We'll see it on the GUI later. And the uh, second kind of, uh, uh, second class of solvers is called the density-based solvers. The pressure-based solver includes the pressure-based segregated solver and the pressure-based coupled solver. The pressure-based 
segregated solver solves the x, y and z momentum equation that is the x, y, z velocity and then using some pressure correction it updates using the continuity equation the uh, velocity values and then it goes in a segregated fashion to solve the other transport equations. What you can see here is each equation is being solved segregatedly or separately so if these equations were dependent on each other very rapidly, very drastically, in that case the pressure based segregated solver may not really help us to achieve convergence. On the other hand, the pressure based coupled solver considers the continuity and the momentum equations together as one single set of equations, tries to solve it simultaneously which is often the case and once the solution is achieved for these equations then it goes on to solve the energy and the species and other transport equations. The density based uh, coupled solver is even stricter. It tries to incorporate the mass, momentum, energy and species equation into one single um, three-dimensional matrix, a hypermatrix. It forms and it tries to solve for all of them in the whole uh, domain and once the solution is converged for these equations then it tries to go ahead and solve for the turbulence equation and the other transport equations. Um, the convergence may or may not be reached in one single iteration but overall the procedure is that the density based solver considers all the equations which are quite coupled to each other, quite dependent on each other especially for highly compressible flows. So it's primarily meant for highly compressible flows. The pressure based uh, solvers like segregated and the coupled solver can be used for incompressible as well as uh, compressible uh, flows. The, as you can see here if there are more equations coupled together what it means is that you need to have a very strong RAM so uh, the cup pressure based coupled solver requires one and a half to two times more memory than the pressure based segregated solver and in the runtime, so the random access memory, the RAM has to be strong enough to handle so many equations over a, let's say a 1 million cells or whatever is the cell count that you're having. So this is computationally very daunting for your computer. You need to have very good hardware for this or for density based solver even harder. It's the work is even harder. So overall what you can see here is that the density based solver is primarily meant for compressible flows and the pressure based can be uh, pressure based solvers can be used for a variety of applications dependent upon uh, what is computationally feasible or cheaper and what is uh, the what is the stability that you require by the way the pressure based coupled solver is what uh, ansys cfd products are aiming to integrate everything into so maybe after a few years you might see that the pressure based segregated and density based coupled solvers get phased out um, the choice is ours to choose the most stable one which would be the coupled uh, approach against the computationally cheaper one which is the segregated approach. So this is how we choose on the general panel we can choose between pressure based and density based. I'll explain to you how the pressure based uh, segregated and coupled solvers are chosen at a later stage. Um, the best practices are the following that the segregated approach is quick and uh, requires less memory that is a lower RAM. It's compatible with most other physical models the pressure based coupled approach the four equations are solved simultaneously so you require higher RAM um, uh, ability to uh, take in so much data so many equations and it requires one and a half to two times more memory and it is not available for Eulerian multiphase or some other kind of applications the density based coupled solver on the other hand it combines all the f uh, five equations that is mass, three momentum and energy equation in case there are also multiple species also those equations so it's fine for highly compressible uh, with combustion and hypersonic flows with shock interactions in such applications it is good to go with the density based solver uh, the implicit is the more generally applicable uh, scheme than the explicit scheme uh, we'll see what this implicit and explicit schemes are but the explicit scheme is very much limited by uh, a number called the Kuran number so it's slower um, but it can take in um, uh, it, it can easily function for a density based uh, coupled solver. Uh, explicit solver can nevertheless be used for uh, situations when the characteristic time scale of the flow is uh, similar in order to the acoustic time scale that is um, it is possible to use it for high Mach number shock waves only for low Mach number shock waves or around uh, Mach number two or three usually the, pr the process um, proceeds with the implicit based density based couple solver 
Let's come down to the discretization schemes now that we know how the equations will be solved either together or in a segregated fashion. Let's see individually these equations, how the analytical equations get converted on a discretized geometry into a uh, algebraic equation. So our task in finite volume method is to obtain linear algebraic equations from the analytical um, uh, the integration equations. So uh, what we try to have is like uh, we have trouble we have trouble usually in the advection or the convection term and the diffusion term because these are surface integrals. The other ones are volume integrals where we can find out the value at the cell centers but on the surface integrals we need to have the values at the faces expressed in terms of the uh, cell center values. So uh, the advection term has the unknown quantity phi at the face centers as you can see here and this one also the, the diffusion term has val the gradients defined at the faces. So the question is how can we obtain these values in terms of the cell centered values because ultimately our aim is to convert this algebraic equation into a linear algebraic equation of cell centered unknown terms phi where a p a n b and s u as we know from the finite volume lecture will be derived dependent upon the mesh size dependent upon the numerical scheme so the task is primarily to obtain this kind of an equation and we are trying to see how we can express them so when it comes to the uh, advection term there are a variety of methods so if you can see here for solution methods we have choices for uh, momentum uh, turbulent kinetic energy or any other transport equation which we are choosing we can choose between the first order upending scheme the power law scheme second order MUSCL quick scheme this is the order of uh, the accuracy but uh, less stable stability so if you are going for high accuracy ultimately you should perform a simulation if possible by either the second order scheme or in some cases also possible the quick scheme which offers you a third order accuracy uh, it can help you to uh, predict the second flows and uh, rotating or swirling flows can be predicted accurately but it requires good grid aligned uh, quad or hex meshes in the case of quick scheme. MUSL scheme does not require it. it can also take in a tri or a tet mesh uh, but um, you can start with a first order upwinding because it's computationally quite stable so what it means is the value at the face is equal to the value upstream of it so it is very good for uh, highly convective flow or inviscid flow so it's it assumes the flow is highly inviscid so it can cause some numerical errors as you will see this. So if you use a first order upwinding scheme, uh, let's uh, see a specific example. Let's say there is a hot fluid and cold fluid passing through two inlets into the domain. So and uh, I'm assuming that this, uh, this is a special kind of a fluid uh, whose thermal conduction coefficient is zero. So thermal conduction coefficient being zero, actually there should be no diffusion across this uh, diagonal line here. But what we see when we perform a simulation is for a coarse mesh uh, with the lower order discretization schemes there is a huge uh, variation in the temperature across the interface although for zero conduction coefficient we should usually have no diffusion because we, the diffusion term is zero in this case but um, if we refine the mesh we can reduce that error we cannot completely get rid of it uh, if the mesh had been uh, flow aligned so aligned along the flow direction this diffusion can be reduced drastically by the way but overall what you can see here is that um, the upwinding schemes, if you go for a high order upwinding schemes, we reduce this kind of numerical, numerical error and by having a finer mesh we can reduce the error even further. So therefore this is the order in which we proceed with the different numerical schemes. So we go from more stability in the beginning, we start with the first order upwinding scheme and we move on to go on to a, a higher order scheme which means uh, more accuracy but of course at a greater computational effort and less stability. So initially we should start with a lower order scheme and we should move on to a second order scheme or higher order scheme for better accuracy and as far as possible to try to maintain uh, the grid being aligned along the flow direction as much as possible to make a grid uh, which would follow the uh, flow direction as much as possible which is which means that usually usually we should not go for such an unstructured algorithm for generating mesh but as much as possible a smooth and structured mesh as you can see on the screen there as far as the diffusion term is concerned the second term on the right hand side the first term as you can see here in this equation set 
So what we have is like we have three methods by which we can calculate this gradient on this discretized geometry. We have a green gauze cell based method, green gauze, green gauze node based method and the CFX inspired least squares cell based method. This is the most accurate and the least uh, one of the least computational effort that it requires. So this is the default scheme now in Fluent. But the earlier schemes, if it was a cord or hex mesh, uh, you could use the green gauze cell based method. If it was a tet mesh, you had to go for a higher accuracy based green gauze node, node based method, but it, it meant a huge computational effort. So therefore, the least square cell based method is the default. You can usually keep this. You don't have to change anything unless your company's practices or your organization's practices differ in this regard. But basically the least square cell based method for the diffusion term for the gradient calculations is quite good enough. In addition to this we also have uh, especially for the pressure based solvers we have the pressure being interpolated on the faces in terms of the cell centered values. This can be done through the standard scheme but uh, for flows which are having high gradients where there is a huge uh, swirling flow if there's a sp steep pressure gradient for example porous jump or flows with strong curvature in that case one should go for the presto scheme if there is highly natural convection high relay number natural convection flows are also occurring in that case the body force weighted option might be a better one so for pressure based solvers uh, we have the we have to have a choice between how the velocity that is the momentum equations need to be coupled together with the continuity equation because how the iterative solver starts is like it assumes the pressure and the velocity field from the previous iteration uses it for the current iteration to calculate the updated values of velocity and pressure terms but uh, what it does is like if, it, if I use directly the pressure field from the previous iteration to calculate in the present iteration what is the uh, velocity field then I will not be um, satisfied my continuity equation. So there is a method of uh, correction, pr pressure correction which is uh, implemented through one of the algorithms, the simple simplex or PISO algorithm in which you try to express uh, the velocities in terms of uh, a pressure correction term P dash and this P dash when substituted into the continuity equation this uh, UVW when substituted into the continuity equation in terms of the pressure correction you get an expression for P dash which uh, when evaluated this pressure correction helps us to uh, close or couple together the continuity and the momentum equations so these are the methods which are available. The most robust of them is the simple algorithm which is the de default method. Uh, inspired by CFX again is the coupled algorithm which we already discussed. This is how we implement the pressure based coupled algorithm. The other three choices that you see here on the screen are pressure based segregated solvers. The piezo algorithm, the piezo algorithm as you can see here, it's very good for unsteady flows and should be used in case you have highly skewed meshes. Now because CFD is uh, an iterative solver, so we have to start with an initial solution. We are actually dealing with nonlinear uh, equations, highly nonlinear partial differential equations. The nonlinearity comes because of the advection term in the transport equations. So we start with an initial solution, initialization, and then we move on towards a convert solution where uh, the residuals or some of the other criteria is met. Now what uh, what is done during initialization. There are different methods by which initialization can be performed. One of them is called the standard initialization in which I assign a specific value all throughout the domain. I can also modify it by doing some kind of patch initialization. That's a more advanced feature where you can uh, create some register, create some regions in which you can patch specific values of pressure or temperature or velocity, all the other uh, dependent variables for which you're solving. The other kind of options which is available already for some versions of Fluent is the FMG initialization which is to be done via the text user interface um, in which you just type uh, after doing a standard initialization it will solve an Euler equation. It is not available for the multiphase flows. There is no initialization done for the multiphase flows but that's why in the release 13 which has been released recently the hybrid initialization has been included which actually solves a potential flow equation and tries to uh, obtain the velocity and the pressure field and other quantities are also averaged out. So it's very helpful for achieving quick convergence even in the case of multi-phase flows there is no limitation you can use the hybrid initialization so this is how the initialization can be performed and once the initialization is done 
um, in some cases you can also initialize it uh, during a, uh, during a, uh, for a given final mesh using a previous uh, solution so let's say I have a solution on a coarse mesh and I want to superimpose that uh, solution onto a final mesh in that case I can do the following I can use that previous solution and I can write something called an interpolation file when I click on interpolate file for previous uh, for the previous mesh file so if I go to file uh, interpolate and then in that case I have the option to write the data of all these files and I can write them and once I can write them I can um, close this session I can read in the final mesh uh, with the appropriate settings uh, using the settings file or setting up the whole problem and then I can go to the same option file interpolate and I can say read and interpolate the data uh, and I can read that appropriate file and you will have the data previous course mesh solution superimposed on the present solution and you can continue with the iterations in this case once we have the solution we have the uh, initialization done I'm sorry then in that case we try to set up some convergence monitors we try to monitor whether our solution in the iterative process it's working well or not so the question comes why should we aim for convergence well there are some different reasons why we are looking for convergence of our numerical solution um, one of the reasons is because we are trying to obtain a numerical solution of our problem it's not an exact solution so we have to satisfy certain constraints within which we can say that okay my solution is uh, acceptable so the solution no longer changes with the subsequent iterations CFD is an iterative process because a nonlinear equation is being converted into a linear equation and therefore it is an iterative process so we have to satisfy this criteria that the solution does not change anymore with subsequent iterations the other thing we have to satisfy are the flux balances for mass momentum and energy and all other scalars the balances should be achieved or in some cases we are also looking for uh, that um, all equations are obeying are being obeyed in the cell so after getting solutions we should ensure that these equations are actually getting um, obeyed in each and every cell within a specific uh, tolerance and this is what is defined as the convergence criteria as you can see here in this residuals monitors panel I can specify the convergence criteria for each of these equations the continuity and the XYZ velocity and this is the convergence criteria which I specify to the software which it requires to meet before it can term a solution to be converged or not there are three main uh, means by which we can check whether the solution is converged or not so one of them is called the equation residuals so the equation residuals are what I just mentioned the equation uh, we specify some criteria within which the equations have to be satisfied within each and every cell or let's say on a global level um, we can also create some point surface or volume monitors we can say okay I want to uh, monitor the uh, mass averaged temperature at the outlet so I will see the temperature at the outlet if it does not change anymore with iterations this means the solution is converged or in the other case I may also in uh, try to check for energy or mass imbalances so by mass imbalances what I mean is that the difference between whatever mass is coming into the domain what is leaving the domain the difference between the two should be such that it is not uh, more than one percent of the lowest flux which is entering or leaving the domain so in that case if these three things are maintained I can say that my solution is converged this is something where I can start looking for accuracy now just to give some uh, brief uh, theory behind the uh, residual, um, residual description basically um, on an infinite precision computer the residuals should actually fall to zero but as you can see on the chart in the previous slide you have something like 1 e 1 to the 1 into 10 to the power minus 5 minus 6 minus 7 so y it will keep on falling to some level but on an actual computer which is not an infinite precision computer because of round off there will be a point beyond which the residuals will not drop further so it is a level value the residuals are calculated in this way that um, it, it tries to main, uh, satisfy the coefficients which are calculated from the previous iteration it is used to calculate the new values of phi through uh, the matrix methods once the equations have been set up for all the cell points then it with the new values of the velocity field it tries to uh, find out the new coefficients and tries to 
uh, find out the difference between the two sides, between the left hand side and the right hand side. It looks somewhat like this. This difference is calculated and this difference should be zero actually for an infinite precision computer and um, the, the scale residual is just a normalized factor is used to normalize it across the, all the cells, not just on one single cell that we are looking for the satisfaction of the equation but over all the cells and there are some methods to normalize it further with respect to the fifth, uh, first five iterations or something so that you get a value between 0 and 1. And what we usually uh, use as some best practices is that at least qualitatively the flow is converged when I say that my equation residuals, especially the continuity and the three momentum equations, fall below this 10 to the power of minus 3 criteria. Uh, energy equation has a stricter convergence criteria that it should fall below 10 to the power minus 6. Then I can say my major um, flow features have been established, they have been resolved and um, let's say I'm also s uh, solving for species transport equation, in that case I also need to check whether the species uh, transport uh, equation residuals is fallen below 10 to the power minus 5. So you can check it against this convergence criteria. If you specify it in the residuals panel then uh, Fluent automatically checks for it.